Welcome back to Dry Dock with Bucketeer. And first off, let me say, yes, I know this video is extremely late. I was planning on trying to get these Dry Dock episodes out the very first week of each month, and I completely failed to do that. I'm By the time this gets posted on YouTube, this is going to be a whole week and a day late. So, sorry. And if you've taken a look at my channel at all in the last month, you'll also realize that based off my last dry dock, I accomplished a grand total of none of it. Yeah, October was not a particularly good month for me. I was working on an outage, and you'd be surprised how much of your creativity is crushed by working 712s for an entire month. Really leaves you without a whole lot of uh, creative spark to do something. Regardless, that's over with, and I'm hoping I can get back into some decent uh, production schedule, getting back into a decent production schedule now. So, what's been happening? Well, actually quite a lot has been happening, surprisingly. While I haven't had a whole lot of motivation to get up and try to create, I've been playing quite a bit. Um, probably the big news in World of Warships is, during the last sale, I went ahead and bought the Sharnhorst for an amount of money that made my wife look at me like I was crazy. For good reason. It's a pretty expensive internet ship, so. But... Oh, it is so worth it. <laughs> I love the Sharnhorst. Um, it's just a heck of a ship. It's a weird ship. It's a ship that takes a different mentality to play. Um, just complete full disclosure, the very first time I took the Sharnhorst out, I was tired. Uh, I'd had a full day at work. I was exhausted, but after having spent a stupid amount of money on this ship, I wanted to actually take it out. And the, one of the... F I distinctly remember, as I'm getting ready to take it out... I thought, do you really want your first mission in this ship to be while you were exhausted and not thinking very clearly? And the rational part of my brain said, no you don't. And the irrational, exhausted part of my brain said, shut up. <laughs> and I took it out and I played it exactly like a battleship, which I know I'm not supposed to do, and got my butt kicked. I think I did 35,000 damage and died like the th second or third ship in the entire match. It was pathetic. Um, but, that being said, I was completely disgusted, rage quit for the night, and uh, went to sleep. Next day I came back, and I actually played it much, much better. And had a fantastic game, and I've been having fantastic games with the Sharnhorst ever since. It, it's, a, it's what I've been looking for in World of Ships. World of Warships. It's not a battleship, it's not a cruiser, it's something very different. And... I actually like that in the premium ships. I like that it's not exactly like everything else. That you can't very quickly say, oh, it's a destroyer, I play it like this. Or, oh, it's a battleship, I play it like this. Now, the Sharnhorst, you got to pay money for it. So it's not something you're going to be subjected to in the tech tree. So I think Wargaming probably feels a little more um, open to trying something different with the ships. And the Sharnhorst is definitely something different from the rest of the ships in the game. And I love it. So, if you've got the money and you see the Sharnhorst available, I would definitely buy it. It is definitely worth owning. Uh, I love it. In other news, I also managed to cap out on my uh, Colorado, finish that one out, and I got myself in North Carolina. And with the sale of my North, with the sale of my Colorado and a lucky loot crate, I managed to get enough cash to also buy and equip a New Orleans. Which, surprise, surprise, turned out to be really good. Um, I'm really enjoying the New Orleans. Turns out to be a really good ship. And the North Carolina is a pretty good ship, too. It's it's strange to actually see that speedometer go over 21 knots. Uh, so that's actually nice to have some maneuverability in that North Carolina. Not to mention it has great AA right out of the box. I've, on multiple occasions, managed to kill entire attacking squadrons of torpedo bombers. So that's nice very nice um really looking forward to playing some of these tier eights now i've definitely seen the the shift in the meta that some people have been talking about specifically moving from ships moving about the map to ships just kind of sitting behind islands going backwards and forwards i've definitely seen some of that and it makes for some frustrating and very boring games but i'm hopeful that that might change no reason for it but it might uh, in other news, the entire month we've had the uh, Takao mission going to earn the uh, arpeggio ship, the uh, Takao. 
And like every one of these arpeggio ship missions, I've been focused pretty heavily on getting it done. Which is bizarre, because I hardly play any of my arpeggio ships at all. Um, the most ships I've ever, the most games I've ever played have been in the Haruna, and it's a grand total of four matches. Uh, yeah. For whatever reason, I work my butt off to get them, and then they just sit in a port I don't ever use, and I never take them out and use them. Which, I mean, part of that comes about down to the fact that you can't actually... They're not normal premiums. You don't get bonus credits. You don't get bonus XP. You can't really use them for training other captains. They're mostly just there. And not to mention that most of them are too low level to actually qualify for most missions, so there's just really no reason to ever take them out. But I still want it. <laughs> Free ship. Not to mention the Otago, which the Takao basically is an Otago. It's a tier 8 ship, and it's a really good one, so... I want it. And I'm almost there. Just another 15,000 base experience. So, getting pretty close. So what else has happened? Well, during the break, I bought Civilization. And Civ 6 is a really good game. Um, I gotta say, it is vastly improved over Civ 5 at launch. I don't really feel like there's much in the way that's missing. I, however, the game is not without its problems. Um, the biggest problem the game has is the UI is just a mess and the AI is utterly brain dead. Um, I mean, in any 4X game like Civilization or Master of Orion or any of these games like this, it's a complicated game and it's very hard to make an AI that can handle the game and give a human player a real challenge. But the problem isn't so much that they don't even give it, it that they don't give enough challenge. Um, you can certainly crank the difficulty up, and then the game just cheats, uh, giving them tons of free resources and free settlers, free cities, all kinds of stuff. But the problem is that in uh, Civ 6, you can't really work with the AI. The way that they've programmed the leaders and the way that you have to deal with their, uh, they're called agendas, basically the main goals that each civilization has, it makes it so that you can't work with them. I mean, I've tried. And it's almost impossible to build any kind of working relationship with any of them. Uh, to give you some examples, uh, China, their agenda that they always have, and every civilization has one agenda that you know and one secret agenda that you got to figure out. And China's always has it agenda is they want to build the most wonders. They want to have as many of the wonders as possible. Well, if anybody who's played Civilization can tell you, you want to build wonders yourself. You don't want to sit back and never build any of your own wonders. That's a terrible way to do things so essentially if China's in your game they're always going to hate you and there's nothing you can do to avoid it they're just going to hate you same thing with Brazil Brazil wants the most great people and yeah again you're not going to avoid taking great people just to keep these guys happy so you are inevitably going to have Brazil pissed off at you the entire game you can't do anything about it and even if, even if you said, okay, I'm not going to take any great people, I'm not going to take, build any wonders, the two of them still might be pissed off at you because they're secret agendas. So, <laughs> it makes it intensely frustrating to try to deal with them. Um, even when you don't want to go to war with the AI, they kind of almost wind up pushing you into it. A uh, good example, um, my last game, I played America, because I just want to give it a try. And I was actually going to try to do a science victory. The problem I run into is Russia decides they're going to forward settle right up against me. And this is back in the ancient era. I mean, we're talking guys with clubs and slingers are all I've got. So I figure, okay, I'll attack. And I do. I take his, I take his city and he forward settled. Now, mind you, this is in like 2500 BC, like some stupidly early era. In the latest game, it is now 1905, and I still have Russia holding a grudge 3,000, yeah, almost 4,000 years later. Russia still holds a grudge about that one tiny little city that I stole from them. And it's just insane. I mean, they, the, the warmonger penalties are horrific. But what's worse is... You can't even start an actual war. Uh, a good example is uh, religion, it, which is its own hot garbage fire at the moment. Um, 
if the other guys start trying to to take over your civilization with religion, if they send their guys in and they start proselytizing, you know, you can tell them stop it. You can't tell them stop it until they've actually started trying to convert a city, which, given the just enormous waves of missionaries that the AI will send in all at once, that means you can lose multiple cities, uh, religions, before you can even tell the guy to back off. And they'll, every time I've told them, they said, okay, fine, we'll back off. And then they just, five turns later, they start trying to uh, convert cities again. And that's not a cause for war. I mean, if you actually have a cause for war, a casus belli, then you can declare war and the warmonger penalty is reduced. It's still huge, but it's reduced. But the AI breaking promises, no issue at all. The AI will break a promise and you can't call them out on it which is terrible. Um, and then you have uh, another good example is just the AI being ridiculous. In that game where Russia hated my guts, every 50 turns, like clockwork, Russia would attack Egypt. Every 50 turns they attack Egypt. Um, they'd declare war, they'd fight back and forth, and then they'd declare peace. And nothing ever changed. I mean, nobody was losing any kind of cities. They were both pretty much at a complete and total stalemate. But I finally get tired of Russia's... I finally get tired of Russia. And in like 1900, I declare war on them. And mind you, this is while Russia is in a war with Egypt. They're in war! They're actually fighting a war with each other. And I get a huge warmonger penalty with Egypt because I didn't have a Casus Belli and I just declared a surprise war on... Russia. They're at war with Russia. Why would Egypt care that I attacked Russia? Why would they care? I, I can't tell you why, but they do. Oh, believe me, they do. As far as Egypt is considered, I am a horrible, warmongering monster. And uh, nothing's going to change that. Uh, this game desperately needs a, uh, a quick a patch for the AI. They need to figure something out. I mean, I like the idea behind the agenda system to actually give the AI a goal and a specific civilization-oriented goal, but man, what they got right now is just not working. All right, uh, I also I still want to get back into a Kerbal Space Program video. Haven't done one yet. Um, honestly, trying to find the time to do a Let's Play, and uh, I just haven't been able to put the time together to make the uh, to do it. I need to. But um, I haven't. So that's definitely on the list to do a Kerbal Space Program video series. And also, I still need to f finish up my uh, United States anti-aircraft historical piece. I still want to do that. I've got a Colorado review that I'm good to go on. I actually have the script written. I have the gameplay recorded. I have the breakdown of the ship recorded. I just have to put together the historical pictures and start assembling it, which is going to be the very next thing I do after this video. And I've also got a couple of opening salvos. I've got that disastrous Scharnhorst one to show you, which I'm actually going to give you a bit of that one and then go to show you the next game where I actually played it properly and had a good game. And I still need to have the Langley because that's just hilarious. I wish I had recorded that with me and my boy when we were both standing there trying to figure out even how carriers worked. Um... So yeah, I got some of those vids. Hopefully they're going to be coming up pretty soon. And in this video is one of my later ranked battles. Yeah, I finished it with uh, 98,000 damage and a, what is that, high caliber? And at least one kill. Was it? Yeah, just one kill. So it was actually a pretty good, it was a pretty good match. We won it. We, oh, sorry. Yeah, spoiler alert. <laughs> Sitting there five ships to one. We won, which was nice. So, yeah, I like ranked play. It's just, it depends on your team very heavily. Alrighty, so, yeah, taking a look at the scoreboard afterwards. 98,000 damage, a kill, a high caliber. This was during the major, I think it was like 200% plus credits in XP. Top of the team in XP. Excellent. Alright, guys, I think that's pretty much going to wrap it up for this month. Next month, I'm going to desperately try to get the... Uh, dry dock out on time but well we'll see 
I'm really going to try to pick up my schedule and get it back under control. All right, guys. This has been Bogatier. I'll catch you next time.